Those are the opening bars from the aria De Vieni alla Finestra from Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. Following its first performance at the end of the 18th century in Prague, the instrument was indelibly typecast as an instrument for serenading. The image of the gentleman serenading the young lady to win her attention was a familiar scene which cropped up frequently in 19th century opera. My name is Nigel Woodhouse. I play the guitar and I also play other related fretted plucked instruments. Today I'm going to talk about the mandolin. Now if you go to an orchestral concert, you probably don't expect to see or hear an instrument such as the mandolin as part of the orchestra. But you may be surprised to learn that uh, among the composers who wrote for this instrument, we can list Vivaldi, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, Verdi, Mahler, Schoenberg, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, to name but a few of the more well-known composers. This particular instrument is made from a combination of spruce on the top and maple on the back. You can see, if you look closely, that it's made from a series of ribs which are created through steam bending the wood and then they're glued together to create this bowl shape which is created over a mould. This instrument was actually made for me by a Japanese maker called Takusari and it's based on a particularly fine model of mandolin originally made by Luigi Emberga who was in Rome at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Emberga mandolins are generally highly regarded and often thought of as the Stradivarius of the mandolin family. Um, they have been copied and they're being reproduced now uh, three generations later and still they are highly sought after instruments. Instruments similar to the mandolin can be traced back as far as the 10th century in medieval Europe. They found their way from North Africa and they existed in many uh, shapes and forms, different numbers of strings, different tunings. Uh, towards the Renaissance period, the mandolin was much closer to the lute in construction the body would have been a much shallower shape with a, a gentle curve underneath it. The fingerboard and neck would have been shorter, but also wider. It would have had more strings on it. Uh, the strings would have been made of gut and the instrument would have been played with a combination of thumb and fingers. This mandolin is often referred to as the Neapolitan mandolin and it can be traced back to the middle of the 18th century when a luthier in Naples had the idea of bending the table over a hot poker to create this angle. This allowed the, the strings to be extended across to the tail of the instrument and it created greater pressure downwards, enabling the instrument to take a higher tension of strings and therefore producing more sustain and more volume. There was an instrument in Italy at the beginning of the 18th century called the mandolino, nowadays referred to as the Baroque mandolin and that coexisted throughout most of the 18th century, but was eventually replaced by the Neapolitan mandolin and its new tuning system based on fifths. The violin, which was regarded as the king of instruments at the time, was one of the models which they were trying to emulate when they chose to move over to the fifth tuning. And a lot of the methods of the day um, often borrowed from violin techniques, particularly, particularly bowing studies, and they translated quite well into methods for developing plectrum technique for string crossing and articulation. Unlike the violin, however, the mandolin has two of each string. They're in close pairs, intended to be played as one string, but it's the doubling of the strings which gives the mandolin its particular resonance and sustain. The strings are tuned using these pegs here, which are um, gears, which are called machine heads and they can be used to tighten or slacken the strings to adjust them to make them the correct pitch. Because we have four pairs of strings, it can often take quite a long time of careful listening to make sure that they're exactly in unison. Two Gs, two Ds, As and Es. The frets on the fingerboard, these metal strips, um, are used to make different pitches along the string. As we press the string onto the fret, we get a different note in each position. So at each fret, as I press down, I'm making the string length shorter. The string you're hearing now is from here to here, as opposed to the open string, which is from here to here. As I go further up the fingerboard, the notes get higher. And that happens on each string.
mandolin can also play chords. Four note chords are not uncommon. In the 18th century, composers would often use arpeggio patterns based on chordal fingerings, which would involve a complex mixture of down and up strokes to create different arpeggio rhythms across the strings, such as... Um, the strings are struck with, nowadays, a piece of plastic, which we call a plectrum. Same as you would use for a guitar or a number of other plucked instruments. In the 18th century, players would have used a quill, which would have been sharpened to a point. And when steel strings took over, the quill, of course, was too weak, and that was replaced by a plectrum made of tortoise shell. Because of the double strings, it helps to enhance the legato of the instrument as the plectrum is moving down and upwards, striking the string from opposite sides. Because of its um, lack of sustain, which it shares with many plucked instruments, a common device used by composers was to repeat the notes but usually in a very measured rhythmical way. We can hear this in Vivaldi's Concerto in C major, which begins with these repeated octave notes. Vivaldi sets up the tone for the whole movement by using that rhythmical device of repeated notes. And we'll see that the same idea is used by many other composers after that. Now, the sound that a lot of people may associate with the, with the mandolin, particularly the Italian mandolin, would be something like this. That's using a device called the tremolo. The tremolo, however, was a very late development in mandolin technique. And for the first hundred years, it was known about, but studiously avoided in artistic circles, as it was thought to be a device used by common street musicians. In the 18th century, when the new Neapolitan mandolin was designed, the treble strings would have been made from some form of animal gut, and the lower strings would have been made from a combination of silk and brass wire wound on to create extra weight. By the late 19th century, however, the mandolin had adapted and taken on steel strings. The instrument had become heavier and stronger in construction. Players were using a, a pick made from tortoise shell to deal with the extra string tension. And that's when the tremolo technique began to take over. Almost everything in the Italian style of playing was assumed that it would be played tremolo unless it was a very short note. Anything that could be played with tremolo would have been. Whereas other schools of playing uh, would be more specific about which notes should be played with a single stroke and which notes should be sustained with the tremolo technique. The tremolo technique was developed widely towards the end of the 19th century as a means of imitating the human voice or the violin for that matter and melodies were constructed which would bring out the cantabile quality of the mandolin. The tremolo technique also allows the instrument to play with a more dynamic range. It defies logic of the plucked instrument, the fact that you can make a note get louder, but the tremolo allows you to do this. If I play a single plucked note, you'll hear that it decays quite rapidly. The higher up the string I go, the more quickly the note decays. The lower strings have more resonance, but again, they get quieter, not louder. So in this case, the tremolo can be used to start the note softly, if you like, and it can be increased gradually. In Mahler's Seventh Symphony, he asks sometimes for the mandolin to play just a single isolated note with a strong attack and a rapid decay, such as this.
Mahler also used repeated notes in his melodic writing, a combination of single stroked repeated notes followed by a tremolo at the end of the melodic passage to give the note a longer decay time. By the turn of the 19th to 20th century, some players had the idea that the mandolin, although it has two distinct textures and sounds, the single plucked note and the tremolo note, a style of playing developed called the duo style, which was a form of combining both sounds to create the effect of two separate voices, one with a single plucked note juxtaposed against a sustained tremolo note. As the mandolin developed towards the end of the 19th century, the fingerboard gradually became extended. And by the early 20th century, we have a full length fingerboard like this, which goes two octaves above the open string, plus another fourth above that. Those notes are not used very often. In Prokofiev's ballet, Romeo and Juliet, the mandolin player is asked to hit a top B on no less than five occasions, which is up here. A note with very little resonance, which has to be hit with quite a lot of attack. It also has to be in unison with the piccolo. The mandolin has been chosen on many occasions to add an unusual sound or colour to the orchestral texture. Very often it's combined with the harp section. In Stravinsky's ballet Agon, he combines the mandolin with the harp to great effect. The mandolin and the harp play a canon in a movement called Galliard. Here he's harking back to an earlier sound world and he makes great use of the open strings in the strident chords which end this passage. In Webern's Five Pieces for Orchestra, the fourth movement, which is only six bars long, begins and ends with solo mandolin. And then four bars later we have... a sound world in miniature. On those last seven notes, the player is asked to do a crescendo, as well as getting slower, before returning to the original tempo on the last two notes and doing a diminuendo. A lot of detail in such a short musical fragment. In Respighi's tone poem, Roman Festivals, the third movement, based on the October celebrations and the wine harvest, we hear a mandolin serenading in the distance with this plaintive melody.
The Neapolitan mandolin isn't the only instrument that's in use today. Because the instrument has never been standardised, it exists in many shapes and forms around the world. When the instrument arrived in the States, it was very soon to be replaced by this type of instrument. The Americans thought that because the mandolin is tuned like a violin, let's see if we can do something to the construction of it, which makes it even more similar to a violin. So they completely changed the body shape using the idea of a carved back and top with the F holes. And they also made the string length longer and the fingerboard wider, which uh, facilitates chordal playing. You can compare the two shapes. And from the back, they're also very different. This is an instrument that was made for me by the Scottish maker, Mike Vanden. It's got a carved top made from spruce and maple back and sides. It's got an ebony fingerboard. The string length is considerably longer and the fingerboard a little bit wider. This type of instrument with its wider fingerboard lends itself more easily to playing chords, and which is why it's found its way into a great deal of folk music, bluegrass, jazz and other non-classical forms of music. Its sound is much more mellow than the um, bright Italian sound of the Neapolitan mandolin. As a chordal instrument, it can be very effective providing a chordal rhythm. In this traditional Irish extract, I'm going to begin by playing just the rhythm and the chords which would echo what would be done on perhaps the baron, the Irish drum, before going into the single note melody, which would be doubled with the fiddle and the pipes. That was a tune called the Kesh Jig, and it crops up in the score to the film The Titanic, where there's an Irish Cayley happening on the lower decks. It's one of a number of Irish tunes which were arranged for that scene. In bluegrass playing, the mandolin is often used to great effect as a rhythm instrument, and here the left hand is very active in terms of deciding when we're going to hear the chord and when we're just going to get a percussive sound. If I form a chord shape such as this, and then relax my fingers, you get this. So whilst the right hand can maintain a regular momentum, it's the squeezing and relaxing of the left hand which creates the harmonies on the offbeat chords. We hear that a lot in American bluegrass and other forms of folk music as well. The name mandolin is a derivative of the name mandola, which is often the name given to the tenor version of the instrument. The earlier Baroque form of the instrument had a much shallower bowl-shaped back, and its shape was similar to that of an almond. So the Italian word mandola, meaning almond, is how the instrument got its name. Like most stringed instruments, the mandolin can produce harmonics. The open string harmonics are quite strong sounding. You can also produce false harmonics, which require a great deal of precision by fingering the note with the left hand. The right hand has to do two things. It has to use the index finger to make the harmonic and the other fingers to hold the plectrum to pluck the string. Occasionally composers would use that to produce a very delicate sound and to create some variation in the melodic line. The string tension on the mandolin is quite high compared to other stringed instruments and one develops layers of hard skin on the fingertips. It's important certainly for the left hand to keep the fingernails very short and as they press down on the string they get stronger 
My little finger certainly got a lot stronger since I've been playing the mandolin. Um, the hard skin helps, of course, but um, keeping the fingernail short is quite crucial. I originally studied the guitar as a music student, and after leaving music college, I became interest, interested in other fretted instruments. One of the attractions for me of the mandolin was concentrating solely on melodic playing and particularly the use of the tremolo, being able to do things with the melodic line that you can't do on most plucked instruments, i.e. to create a sustained cantabile sound and to have crescendos and diminuendos within the melodic phrase. If you're interested in taking up the mandolin and you're wondering about how to go about buying an instrument, I would say it depends partly on your budget and also on what style of music you're interested in learning to play. Generally speaking, an instrument like this is probably more available at a lower price and you can get quite a decent instrument for a few hundred pounds. Things to look out for are the tuning on an instrument um, to, to check that the instrument does not play too out of tune as you go further up the fingerboard. If you're dead set on playing Italian music and you want a truly authentic Italian sound, then I would recommend that you look for an instrument which has a round back like this. Again, same thing applies. Check the tuning on the instrument because a poor quality instrument may not be very accurate in terms of tuning.